welcome everyone um, to this uh, Pufendorf lecture and to our Pufendorf lecture, Professor Susan Wolf. Uh, my name is Tone Rano Rasmussen and I will be chairing this session. Now, <clears throat> when Lund University was founded in 1666, it was done very much in order to, in a sense, prevent young people who were seeking higher education to go to Denmark and the University of Copenhagen. Um, uh, Denmark was a country that Sweden at that time had been at war with for considerable time. No? Uh, so the idea was to um, sort of have a university that was really attractive. And to do that, the university appointed what at that time was perhaps the leading philosopher, or at least the leading thinker in, in, in political thinker, namely Pufendorf. No? Now, our days of headhunting is probably belonging to the past, but it's still the case that since 2003, the philosophy department, or rather the three units of the philosophy department, practical philosophy, theoretical philosophy, and, and cognitive science, we get together and nominate a Pufendorf lecture every year. We do so in order to honor the excellence of a, of a colleague, and we do so also in order to be inspired and to help other people to get inspired. No? Uh, so things haven't changed that much from the early, early days. No? Now, one might say that when it comes to philosophy, it's not that obvious that philosophers do inspire people. Um, it's said that we philosophy, contemporary philosophy, tend to be very sort of myopic that we are dealing with matters that at best are only of interest to to some other philosophers. Um, I happen to disagree with that. Uh, in fact, if I have to be a bit personal, I think that many of the things that I'm dealing with is actually only of interest to myself. But I can, I can assure you that when it comes to this year's lecture, all of these accusations fall short. They have no bearing at all. If there's something that is characteristic of Susan Wolf's work since the 80s, where she produced a number of series of papers <coughs> on free will and determinism, and, and as our views on us as responsible beings, uh, papers like the Moral Saints paper, the importance of free will, and, and so on, is precisely your, I would say, nearly fearless appetite of, of taking on some of the true classical problems and, 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 and questions in philosophy. Um, you do this, um, and I think there's actually another very admirable feature of, of, of your work, um, namely that you manage to make many of these topics that are really complex, and you have written about several other topics than, than, than uh, on, in philosophy of action, though. I mean, um, notorious difficult issues like the meaning of life, on, on values, the difference between uh, moral values and non-moral values, on attitudes or emotions like love, and so on. There's a long list of these subjects where Susan Wolf have contributed. And you do so, if I may say so, in, in, a, in a rather remarkable way. You manage to engage your reader in a sort of conversation where you feel that you take part in a conversation with someone that is really wise. And I, I'm really envious about that aspect of your work. No? Now, um, I'm not going to continue very much here. I think it's important that you talk and, and uh, that I shut up. But uh, uh, let me just say that from the side of the Department of Philosophy, we are absolutely thrilled to have you here. Um, I should also say for any one of you who, who are not that familiar with, with Susan Wolf that she's um, Edna G. Curry's Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at University of, of, um, uh, of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. You're also a fellow of the American um, uh, Academy of Arts and Science, which I, if I remember you were appointed in 1999. So, um, but most of all, you are now this year's Pufendorf Lecture. So let us give a warm hand and welcome Susan. Thank you. Okay. This just went on. Can you, 
It's really hard to hear this. <laughs> Can you hear me and understand it well? All right, I'll get used to it, I think. Uh, let me also figure out how to work this. Done. Okay, so thank you, Tony, for that beautiful introduction. I'm still blushing. Uh, and let me thank the university and the philosophy department for inviting me to give this distinguished lecture series, uh, and for coming to Lund, which I've never been to before, and I'm really enjoying. Uh, my training in philosophy was very weak on political philosophy, and especially on the history of political philosophy. So I didn't learn of Samuel Puffendorf until I took a position at Johns Hopkins University, where I had the good fortune of gaining as a colleague and friend the outstanding philosopher and historian of philosophy, Jerome Schneewind. Schneewind regarded Puffendorf as a pivotal figure in the history of philosophy, particularly in the development of the moral and political views that, by way of the Enlightenment, have come to dominate Western philosophy today. These views include a conception of morality as consisting of a set of rules which members of society can and should be held accountable to, thanks to their capacities for rational deliberation. As I'm persuaded by Schneewin's account of Pufendorf's importance, and as I find the moral framework which we have inherited from him plausible and appealing, I'm especially delighted to be giving lectures named in his honor. Still, I wonder what he would think of them, or what he will think of them if as I read on the website, he still haunts the King's Hall, not so far away from here, where he once taught and wrote. For these lectures are primarily aimed at reminding us, us philosophers especially, but also social scientists, policymakers, and a more general public, of how much there is of importance to our identities that is not about morality or about our abilities to abide by rules by which we can hold each other accountable, and of which there, and of how much there is of importance to who we are, that does not depend, or at least does not depend exclusively, on our capacities for rational deliberation. Though these lectures are therefore not anti-Pufendorfian, to the contrary, I would want to insist, they do mean to withdraw some attention away from the features of human life on which Pufendorf focused and draw it towards some aspects from which Pufendorf abstracted. What I mean by this admittedly vague and obscure comment will emerge in the course of the lectures themselves. Let me make one more comment before I just get on with the lecture. Uh, the three lectures that begin today are intended to cohere with and relate to each other. They all, at least to my mind, suggest and support a single, though still somewhat sketchy, view about what it is to be human, what it is to be a self, and what the concept of responsibility means for us humans. But not knowing or expecting that all the same people will come to all three lectures, I've tried to make the lectures comprehensible, and I hope even somewhat re rewarding, to someone who attends one or two of these lectures without going to the other one or two. The lectures, in other words, relate to each other more as spokes on a wheel connected to a central hub than as steps on a ladder leading step by step to a final conclusion. My lecture today begins with the concept of responsibility. The term is used in a multitude of ways for a multitude of purposes. It's frequently invoked in the context of inquiries into the causes of things. What is responsible for that clump of dead trees? Was it an avalanche or a storm or an infestation of beetles? What is responsible for the smile on your face? Some good news, a new friend, or the unusually sunny weather? This causal use of the term is often contrasted with another, as in a, and as it might be thought, deeper sense of responsibility that is in, intended when one wants to know not only what caused, sorry, I'm, 
what caused an event or state of affairs, but whether anyone, and if so, who, deserves blame or credit for it, or whether the event reflects something about the individual who had a role in its occurrence that would make punishment or reward, condemnation, gratitude, or perhaps admiration appropriate. The contrast between these two broad senses of responsibility is often marked with the labels of causal and moral responsibility, respectively. For the most obvious illustrations of the distinctions are ones in which it is the legitimacy or appropriateness of moral judgments and attitudes that are at issue. One would not blame, at least not morally blame, an avalanche or even a horde of beetles for killing the trees. They do not deserve punishment, nor would indignation towards them be appropriate. If a camper carelessly dropped a cigarette that started a forest fire, on the other hand, that would be another story. Similarly, it seems one would not credit, or at least not morally credit, the sunshine for one's good mood, but if someone had gone out of her way to benefit you, a certain kind of gratitude and praise might be appropriate. Philosophical interest in moral responsibility also has a wide range of sources and is linked to a correspondingly wide range of issues. Since moral praise and especially moral blame have serious consequences, it's a matter of great importance to know when and under what conditions the relevant moral judgments and attitudes are deserved. A less obviously practical but still clearly philosophical reason for being interested in moral responsibility, though, is the thought that responsibility is somehow connected with what makes us distinctively human. For it seems that humans, and only humans, at least among the creatures with whom we're currently in contact, can be appropriate bearers of the kinds of attitudes and judgments we might bear towards the careless camper as opposed to the insects. And it doesn't seem unreasonable to think that this is reflective of something important about ourselves. It is this sort of interest, an interest, that is, in the connection between our status as responsible agents and what sets us apart from other animals and at least present-day machines, that leads me to my topic today. For I suspect that the tendency to identify the sense of responsibility that might be illuminating in this context with specifically moral responsibility leads us to overemphasize certain aspects of our psychologies and to neglect the importance of others. For this reason, I want to look at what appear to be instances of responsibility that are akin to instances of moral responsibility in being more than and deeper than causal responsibility, but that are concerned with a range of judgments and attitudes that are not particularly or essentially moral. I want specifically to look at a range of phenomena this suggests that there is such a thing as aesthetic responsibility. By aesthetic responsibility, I mean to refer to a kind of deep but non-moral responsibility that an artist may have for the aesthetic qualities of his or her artworks. That there is such a thing is suggested by several kinds of experience. Consider first the following examples. You have a friend who is an aspiring painter whose work is largely non-representational. You walk into his studio one day and are struck by a canvas still on the easel. You are inclined to think it is the best thing he's ever done, but before you get beyond your initial wow, he says, oh, that's just a mistake. I knocked a paint can over on the canvas and haven't gotten around to cleaning it off yet. Or, suppose that you read a short story that impresses you for its ability to succeed on two levels. Read straight, it has an interesting plot, decent characters, and a sensible message. But certain details call to mind a Greek legend that allow you to interpret it also as a wry commentary on an ancient tale. The protagonist is named Penelope, let's say and the story concerns her way of handling some overly aggressive suitors. Now, imagine your reaction when you discover that the parallels to Homer are purely accidental. In fact, the author has never heard of the Odyssey, and she named her heroine after Penelope Cruz. 
In both these cases, as I understand them, you're initially inclined to credit the artist, but you reasonably withdraw your credit upon learning that the qualities in the art you admired were merely accidental. Although the artist in each case remains causally responsible for the artwork, he spilled the paint after all, and she wrote the story, neither are aesthetically responsible for the qualities that make you admire the art. The fact that in these examples we find it natural to withdraw credit highlights the fact that in more typical cases we give credit. Other things equal, we take it for granted that the features of an artwork that make it good are due to the artist. They are not independent of the artist's aesthetic vision and skill. But my interest in aesthetic responsibility is not restricted to the questions of whether artists deserve credit or discredit for the aesthetic qualities of their artworks. At least as important is the appropriateness of a range of judgments and attitudes that are not solely or primarily evaluative. Most of us, when we respond to art, do not just judge them on a scale of aesthetic excellence. We like some art, some music, some novels more than others. And in many cases, the way we feel about the art gives rise to or perhaps is inseparable from feelings or attitudes towards the artist. I love Henry James, but not James Joyce. Matisse, but not Picasso. Even though I readily admit that the artistic excellence of the artists I prefer is no greater than that of the ones who leave me cold. It is not just credit that I give the ones who are my favorites. It's also a kind of affection. This was the first PowerPoint I ever made, so I kind of <laughs> went a little crazy. All right. <laughs> there is then an emotional aspect to the attitudes many of us have toward our favorite authors, composers, and filmmakers. In some people, it fuels an interest in the biographies of these artists. In others, like me, it explains a reluctance to learn about the rest of the artist's life for fear of spoiling or complicating the image that supports one's positive feelings. There are fan clubs, or more formally named societies, for artists ranging from Smokey Robinson to Chopin, from Astrid Lindgren to Dante Alighieri. And I suspect that most of the members of such organizations would describe their attitudes to their subjects in warmly personal terms. These attitudes seem to me of a piece with the sorts of attitudes the philosopher P.F. Strawson discusses in Freedom and Resentment. Wanting to bring out the close connections between our practice of holding people morally responsible for their actions and our tendencies to regard them as appropriate objects of such attitudes as gratitude and resentment, Strawson contrasts these reactive attitudes with the objective attitude. You have to excuse me for this very long quotation, but at least you can read along with me. To adopt the objective attitude to another human being, Strawson writes, is to see him perhaps as an object of social policy, as something certainly to be taken account, sorry, I'm losing my place, perhaps precautionary account of, to be managed or handled or cured or trained, perhaps simply to be avoided. The objective attitude, he continues, may be emotionally toned in many ways, but not in all ways. It may include repulsion or fear, it may include pity or even love, though not all kinds of love. But it cannot include the range of reactive feelings and attitudes which belong to involvement or participation with others in interpersonal human relationships. It cannot include resentment, gratitude, forgiveness, anger, or the sort of love which two adults can sometimes be said to feel reciprocally from each other, for each other. As Strawson notes, we can take the objective attitude toward any individual, at least for a limited time, but when considering lower animals, young children, machines, or human beings with certain severe forms of mental illness or incapacity, we judge that only the objective attitude would be appropriate. Strawson's focus, like the, that of most philosophers who write on freedom and responsibility, 
is on moral responsibility and on the moral or nearly moral attitudes that are reactions to the good or ill will pers one person exhibits toward another. But insofar as he includes the sort of love which two adults can sometimes be said to feel reciprocally for each other in his list of reactive attitudes, he suggests that the moral and near moral attitudes are part of a larger set. For the basis for such love is hardly limited to the degree to which the parties show good will to each other. Whom we love and how our loving relationships go may have as much to do with the individual's senses of humor, their responses to nature, or their engagement with politics. It seems to me that the attitudes of love, affection, or alternatively of chilliness or distaste that one might have toward an artist on the basis of her artwork falls into this broader range. Indeed, it seems easy to imagine a person literally falling in love with a poet or painter on the basis of his poetry or painting, and to see how an already established loving relationship can suffer as a result of how one responds to the other's art. And it seems that the tendency to form attitudes of affection or distaste toward an artist on the basis of her artwork is premised on assumptions about the kind of creature the artist is in ways similar to the way our more paradigmatic reactive attitudes are conditioned. If we learn that a forest fire was set off by a bolt of lightning, any tendency to anger or indigni indignation is apt to go away. Similarly, if one learned that a cherished painting had been painted by an elephant, I suspect that any tendency one had to love the artist would spontaneously disappear. Insofar as our tendency to resent or feel grateful to another for his actions is indicative of our taking him to be morally responsible then, I suggest that our tendency to feel affection or distaste for an artist on the basis of her artworks is a sign that we take her to be aesthetically responsible as well. Although I hope and expect that my discussion so far has called up experiences that will be familiar to most of you, I also expect that some will be skeptical of my interpretation of these phenomena and that others, even if they agree that such experiences reflect a tendency to hold artists aesthetically responsible, will think that the tendency should be suppressed rather than validated. My claim that we have reacted attitudes towards artists on the basis of their artworks will not resonate with everyone. Some will not find in themselves any feelings towards the artists of the works they admire or despise. When they watch a movie or look at a painting or listen to music, they will say, they focus on the artwork and don't give the artist a moment's thought. Though they might have a favorite painter, composer, or director, they take that to mean only that the artist in question is a reliable creator of work, that they, of work that they can expect to find rewarding. It reflects no deeper or more reactive attitude toward the artist than one would have toward a bird whose song one finds particularly pleasing, or a car manufacturer whose cars one has been consistently satisfied with. That was for the Swedish audience. <laughs> My first response to such a skeptic is to wonder whether our experiences of art can really be as different as our words seem to reflect. Perhaps my descriptions of the attitudes and judgments I mean to refer to have highlighted aspects of these phenomena in misleading ways. For I too focus on and even get immersed in the experience of the artworks themselves. What attitudes I have towards the artists are in most contexts of secondary interest and often go by unnoticed. Nor do I mean to claim that the tendency to form reactive attitudes or even judgments awarding more or less aesthetic credit to artists is universal among art lovers, or that people who sometimes form such attitudes and judgments form them whenever they appreciate art. Some kinds of art and some individual artworks are more apt to evoke such reactive attitudes than others. Some artworks seem especially to express a point of view or an emotional experience that one naturally takes to be a reflection, if not an intentional communication, of the artist's soul. Other works, either more purely sensual or 
more purely cerebral, are less likely to be seen as outpourings of a unique human sensibility. Furthermore, different people engage with art for different reasons. They look for and receive different kinds of rewards. In speaking of the phenomena that I take to reflect a tendency to see artists as aesthetically responsible then, I have no wish to make normative, much less universal, judgments about how people should experience art. It's enough for my purposes to bring attention to the fact that many people do respond to art in this way. If the skeptic doesn't find such experiences in himself, he can consider the reactions of others. It is important to me, however, that such reactions be legitimate, so I need to respond to objections that charge the tendency to regard artists as aesthetically responsible for their artworks as in some way wrong or misguided. Two sorts of objections seem especially likely, one epistemic, the other aesthetic. The first objection concerns the thought that the judgments and attitudes we form towards artists on the basis of their artworks are frequently based on assumptions that are epistemically unsound. Who has not been tempted to infer from a particularly realistic and insightful novel or film that the events portrayed by the novelist or filmmaker must be partly autobiographical? Many of us may also tend to assume that in order for emotions to be effectively conveyed in a piece of music or a poem, they must have been experienced by the artist herself or even that an actor who convincingly portrays intelligence must be intelligent, or that one who excels in portraying psychologically twisted characters must be somewhat twisted himself. To the charge of inferring more about the lives and characters of artists from their artworks than is warranted, I plead guilty. I often make unsound leaps from artists' works to their lives and personalities, and I'm often, well, sometimes proved wrong. But these sorts of judgments and the attitudes that they bring with them are not the ones I'm concerned to defend. The judgments and attitudes that constitute attributions of aesthetic responsibility can be and often are narrow. They presuppose that the aesthetic qualities of the artwork come from the artist in a way that is more than merely causal, but they need not assume that they show anything more about him than that he had it in him, psychologically, to create this very work. Even this, however, a critic might object, is apt to be an ungrounded assumption. Who knows which aesthetically relevant features an artist put into her work on purpose, as opposed to ones that appear in the work accidentally. Rarely does an artist leave notes or give an interview that tells us what went through her mind. And when artists do speak about what they take their work to mean, or about what they find aesthetically significant about it, their remarks are often disappointingly vague, pretentious, or full of spiritual gibberish. So this is the guy whose work just sold for $93 million. <laughs> Moreover, and here, the epistemic objection blends into an aesthetic one. Why should we care about what the artist put into her work non-accidentally in the first place? Isn't it better to just look or listen to the works themselves to see what we can find in them independently of the artist's intentions? For an artist does not have privileged access to or authority over the meaning or the value of her work. The fact that an artist intends her work to express something is no guarantee that, she, that the work succeeds in doing so. Nor does the fact that an artist did not intend her work to express something mean that it doesn't express it nonetheless. To the charge that our tendency to regard artists as aesthetically responsible for their art encourages us to form unjustified beliefs about the artist, we now add the objection that this tendency encourages a regrettable approach to appreciating and understanding the art. The second criticism is a form of the intentional fallacy, a critique especially of an approach to literary interpretation given, given prominence by William Wimsatt and Monroe Beardsley 
in the 1950s. Though I'm sympathetic to the core of Wimsett and Beardsley's criticisms, uh, they are often understood in a way that seemed to me unacceptably broad. Specifically, although the fallacy that Wimsett and Beardsley argue for is literally, is literally directed at the idea that an artist's intentions are of key importance to a correct understanding of or approach to her work, the objection is frequently interpreted as a rejection of the tendency to connect the meaning and significance of an artwork with the psychology of the artist at all. This broader interpretation of the intentional fallacy blurs the distinction between the question of whether an aesthetic feature of a work reflects the artist's intentions and the question of whether it is the product of the artist's psychology more generally. And although I agree with Wimsett and Beardsley that emphasis on the former question is usually a bad strategy for the appreciation of art, to utterly dismiss the latter question seems to me with respect to a great deal of art, disastrous. For the fact that an artist did not intend to communicate what in fact the art calls up does not imply that what the artwork evokes doesn't come from the artist in some significant way. We can easily imagine a songwriter saying, I didn't mean to write a sad song, while simultaneously acknowledging that the sadness that is there is an unintentional manifestation of something in him. In characterizing aesthetic, aesthetic responsibility, I've been self-consciously vague in describing the assumed connection between an artist's psychology and the aesthetic features of her work. I've said that it's a condition of holding an artist aesthetically responsible in this way, that the features be non-accidental, that when we credit or form a reactive attitude to the artist on the basis of her artwork, we presuppose that it shows something about the artist, namely that the artist had it in her to create precisely this work. But I deliberately avoided any talk of an artist's intentions, decisions, and choices, or any suggestion that the artist would know, much less be in a position to say, exactly what he was doing aesthetically or why. We're too familiar with artists whose poetry, paintings, or songs were composed when they were on drugs or in dreamlike states, of others who talk about being taken over by their muses and of the mysteries of the creative process, to expect or assume that all the aesthetic features of a work to which we respond are the result of an artist's intentions. But this doesn't stop us from crediting the artist with the particular aesthetic vision that is realized in her artwork. To deny that it matters to our understanding and appreciation of art, whether an artwork reflects an artist's psychology at all, would commit one to the view that it is irrelevant even that an artwork is a product of a human or other intelligent sensibility. It would imply that it is or should be irrelevant to one's experience of a set of words on a page. <coughs> Sorry. It would imply that it is or should be irrelevant to one's experience of an interestingly shaped piece of stone, whether it was sculpted by a human agent or shaped by the forces of wind and rain. That it is or should be irrelevant to one's experience of a set of words on a page, whether it was composed by a poet or was rather, as some fanciful philosophical essays would have us imagine, the product of a monkey randomly plunking on a keyboard. Recalling an example I brought up earlier, it would imply that it shouldn't matter to our experience of a painting, whether it was done by a person or an elephant, or to our experience of a piece of music, whether it was composed by a human or a machine. At least one influential theorist of art, Clive Bell, advocated this radical doctrine. His extreme doctrine of aesthetic formalism claimed that the only thing of aesthetic significance in the visual arts was significant form, defined as combinations of lines and colors that provoke a, distinct, a distinctive aesthetic emotion. For Bell, the aesthetic qualities of a painting do not even depend on whether the painting is representational or, if the painting is representational, on what it represents. 
Indeed, Bell goes so far as to say that representation in a painting is at best a distraction. But this is an absurd thing to say of Hoffer's Nighthawks, or Fra Angelico's Annunciation, or a late Rembrandt self-portrait. Part of what it is to appreciate these paintings is to recognize the sense of human isolation, of beatific serenity, and of psychological insight that is inextricable from seeing these paintings as the evocative artworks they are. It may not be literally impossible to see paintings in this way without assuming that they were non-accidentally pro produced by human beings, but it is certainly not an aid to appreciation to try to suppress or deny this assumption. If we turn to literature, the idea that the author or poet is irrelevant to literary interpretation is even more obviously outrageous. For the very recognition of the marks on the page or the sounds on the audio tape as words, much less as metaphors and puns, character sketches and plots, presupposes that they are products of a human intelligence, and indeed of a human intelligence equipped with a culturally and historically specific language. At any rate, few aestheticians would go as far as Bell. Even Wimsatt and Beardsley admit that a poem does not come into existence by accident. The words of a poem come out of a head, not out of a hat. Clarifying the assumption on which the according of aesthetic responsibility rests should, I believe, put both the epistemic and the aesthetic objection to our tendency to regard artists as aesthetically responsible to rest. The assumption that the aesthetic features of artworks show something about their artists, though falsifiable, seems innocent enough, and if that assumption, along with one's experience of a work, grounds an impulse to credit or feel affection or distaste for its artists, so be it. Still, those who don't find such a tendency in themselves might continue to feel uncomfortable, suspicious that those who do have such a tendency are likely to come to art for the wrong reasons and to experience art in a less than optimal way. Again, let me emphasize that I have no wish to make any normative claims about the appreciation of art. I don't mean to suggest that people ought to regard artists as aesthetically responsible much less that the point of art is always to put you in a relationship with the artist, giving you results that would be more efficiently and straightforwardly achieved by reading the artist's autobiography or just taking him to lunch. It's rather that for many consumers of art, including myself, we just do automatically and spontaneously regard artists as aesthetically responsible for their art. We cannot help but experience much art as the non-accidental product of an intelligent artist, and sometimes as a reflection of the artist's soul, or more cautiously, as an expression of the artist's point of view or of her distinctive aesthetic vision. If we particularly admire or even love the work of art, we may naturally find ourselves crediting and feeling grateful to the artist. At the least, I've argued, such responses are typically unobjectionable, but for large categories of art, they are more than that. <coughs> Tolstoy, in his treatise on aesthetics, What is Art?, wrote that <coughs> every work of art causes the receiver to enter into a certain kind of relationship, both with him who produced or is producing the art and with all those who simultaneously, previously, or subsequently receive the same artistic impression. Speech, transmitting the thoughts and experiences of men, serves as a means of union among them, and art acts in a similar manner. The peculiarity of this latter means of intercourse being that whereas by words a man transmits his thoughts to another, by means of art he transmits his feelings. Although Tolstoy overgeneralized and overmoralized in presenting this thought as a universal norm, the continued appeal and popularity of his theory of art testifies to the fact that the kind of glimpse into another's heart and soul and the communion with the artist as well as with other similarly responding appreciators of art 
are among the deepest and most common rewards art has to offer. Another immensely important benefit of art is its ability to expand our knowledge and understanding of the range of human character and sensibility our world contains. Both such rewards are premised on the assumption that art is a reflection of what the artist feels, sees, and thinks. Both such rewards thus rely on the assumption that, in the sense I have been meaning to point out, artists are commonly aesthetically responsible for the aesthetic features of their artworks. But should we really refer to the phenomena I've been discussing as involving a kind of responsibility? Although the term seems natural when un introduced in some contexts, it may seem out of place or misleading in others. The word comes easily when contrasting the relationship of an artist to a canvas he painted with his relationship to one in which he clumsily knocked over some cans of paint. That is, it seems natural to say in this case that he is responsible for the aesthetic qualities of the one, but not of the other. And it seems natural to make the reverse judgment of aesthetic responsibility when explaining the shift in our attitudes when we discover that the artist of a strikingly colored painting was colorblind or that the writer of an evocative string of words doesn't even speak the language of the words he, said, he wrote down. There's an enormous difference between learning what an aesthetically interesting object, of learning that an aesthetically interesting object, be it a visual or tactile form or a series of words or a set of musical notes, was painted or written or composed by a conscious human being and learning that it came about by someone slipping on some paint or copying words from a dictionary or plunking random keys on a keyboard. And this difference affects our attitudes and judgments about both the object and its creator. It doesn't seem unnatural to express this difference by saying that in the first case, but not the second, we find the creator or artist responsible for the aesthetic features of her creation. And to say this is to suggest that there is a difference between merely causal responsibility and another kind, which is deeper. But the patterns according to which we form and withdraw attitudes and judgments towards artists on the basis of their artworks are in some ways quite different from those that characterize our practices of according moral responsibility. And when we focus on these differences, we, find, we may find the idea that they are both forms or expressions of responsibility more confusing than helpful. In particular, it's commonly thought that whether a person is morally responsible for something, for something he's done, depends on whether he could have done otherwise, on whether he had control of his behavior, on whether he knew what he was doing. If a person is morally responsible, it's been said, he should be able to explain or justify his behavior. It is at the least appropriate to ask him to do so. He's answerable for what he has done. As I pointed out earlier, however, we apply no such conditions in cases of aesthetic responsibility. We don't expect Shakespeare or Cezanne or Mozart to be able to explain their choices of words, lines, and notes. And the question of whether they could have done otherwise, written different plays, painted different paintings, composed different symphonies, seems utterly beside the point in determining what attitudes to have to these artists on the basis of their art. Focusing on these contrasts may make us think that the attitudes we form towards artists on the basis of their artwork, even the attitudes of credit, are not really manifestations of a belief in anything properly called responsibility. We admire Shakespeare, certainly, for his richly insightful, clever, and moving plays, but it sounds odd to say that we hold him responsible for these works. Those familiar with the philosophical literature on responsibility may have heard of a distinction introduced by Gary Watson between two senses of responsibility both different from and deeper than causal responsibility that Watson called attributability and accountability. According to Watson, we invoke the attributability sense when by saying X is responsible for Y, we attribute Y to X in the sense that we take Y to show something about X, 
to be disclosive of X's self. In other instances, Watson reminds us, we use the expression to say that X may properly be held accountable for Y. If Y is bad, this would justify our blaming X or punishing him or expecting him to explain, apologize, or compensate the victim for Y's effects. The idea that an individual must be in control of something in order for him to be responsible for it makes sense if one's thinking of responsibility as accountability, but not perhaps in connection with attributability. The question of whether we should think of responsibility as actually having these two senses rather than only one or three or even more is a matter of academic debate. I don't want to enter into the debate here, but Watson's distinction may be useful in helping us understand the ambivalence or confusion some might have towards the idea of aesthetic responsibility. For once this distinction is articulated, it seems clear that my discussion of aesthetic responsibility had attributability rather than accountability in mind. Indeed, as I've been using the phrase, to say that an artist is, is aesthetically responsible for her art is simply to say that the work can be attributed to her in a deeper or stronger way than a merely causal sense, that it has a stronger and more personal connection to her than a mere causal connection would imply, that it comes from her and says something about her, that it is disclosive of herself. It's relatively unimportant whether one uses, wants to use the word responsibility to refer to this connection, though unfortunately to a substitute talk of attributability here would bring problems of its own. One problem is that the word is so vague and colorless that it gives no indication of a difference between attributing something to an individual and simply predicating it of her, and mere predication is much too broad to capture what is intended by the term. The other is that in the domain of art in particular, attribution already has a fixed and different meaning. To attribute a work of art to an artist is simply to claim that he is the person who created it as opposed to students in his workshop or <coughs> others in his school. In any case, I believe that our ambivalence and confusion about how to refer to and think about the phenomena that manifests what I've been calling aesthetic responsibility shows us something about both the concepts that philosophers discuss and about the relation of these concepts to our lives and self-understanding. Let me conclude by pointing out a couple of the lessons that I think can be learned from these reflections. One lesson that can be learned, or at any rate reinforced, is that the concept of deep, not merely causal responsibility is not as clear or as clean as many people take and want it to be. As I've mentioned, one way philosophers deal with this distinguishes different senses of responsibility, including at least responsibility as attributability and responsibility as accountability. Another, or perhaps this is just a verbal variant of the first, would understand responsibility to refer only to accountability and treats the notion of attributability as an independent concept. Although I don't favor one of these approaches over the other, Thinking about the phenomena that I've been referring to as indications of aesthetic responsibility gives added reason to think that some such distinction or clarification is necessary for understanding our talk of responsibility. But attributability itself, if it's meant to refer to a substantial and interesting relation between individuals and their actions, properties, and effects, is far from well understood. Earlier, following Watson, I characterized it as having to do with a disclosure or reflection of a self. But what is a self? On what basis do we or should we regard beings as having or being selves, as opposed to just being creatures or objects of other sorts? Can a robot be or have a self? What about a chicken, an infant, a two-year-old? And on what basis do we or should we decide what is part of someone's self and what is alien to it? Strawson's discussion of the contrast between reactive attitudes and the objective attitude that I mentioned earlier in the lecture is suggestive in this context. 
it seems plausible that the only kinds of creatures to whom it is reasonable to robustly attribute things, that is, the only kinds of beings who have sufficiently complex intelligence and sensitive selves, are the ones to whom we find it appropriate to have reactive attitudes. Moreover, this thought seems equally plausible with respect to aesthet the aesthetic cases as it does to the moral ones. We don't have reactive attitudes to elephant painters, to typing monkeys, or to finger painting toddlers, but we do, or at least we may, toward Jackson Pollock and Virginia Woolf. Recalling that Strawson also connects the appropriateness of the reactive attitudes with the potential for involvement or participation with others in interpersonal human relationships, suggests that the task of understanding what it is to be or to have a self is closely related to the task of understanding what it is to be distinctively human. It's perhaps with respect to this question that attention to the phenomena I've been discussing today can be most philosophically useful as a corrective to an unduly narrow identification of humanity with rational agency that has dominated philosophical thought. When we ask what it takes to be human, understanding this is a broadly ethical rather than a scientific and biological question, the first thing that leaps out at us tends to be our intelligence, which we have to a higher degree than any other creatures with whom we're acquainted. Historically, we've tended to identify intelligence with the capacity to reason, the ability to think abstractly, and the ability to use language. These, in turn, have led to our ability to justify our beliefs and actions to ourselves and to others, and our abilities to act in accordance with laws we give to ourselves and with values we endorse. No doubt these abilities play a large role in what makes us, as a group especially interesting and important to each other. They are essential to our ability to engage in scientific inquiry and in our ability to be moral agents. But our experience of art, at least the experience of some of us in connection with some art, as well as the urge to make art, which I've barely mentioned in this talk, also suggests or points to features that make us especially interesting and important to each other. And it's interesting to note that when we ask ourselves what kinds of individuals might be capable of what I've been calling aesthetic responsibility, we're unlikely to focus on quite the same traits and capacities or identify quite the same range of creatures. It seems possible to imagine rational creatures, perhaps extraterrestrials or very advanced machines, who lack the capacity to create or appreciate anything we can recognize as art and to imagine, if not actually find individuals who do create significant art, even though they lack the deliberative powers and control that would be needed to regard them as fully morally responsible agents. The importance of art in people's lives, both the drive to create it and the passion to experience it, is a remarkable fact of human life, universal across place and time and culture. Arguably, it's as much a mark of the human as is the use of language. Presumably, part of why art moves or speaks to us so strongly is that through art we can discover and make contact with the emotions, experiences, thoughts, and perspectives of other human souls. Thinking about what it takes to create art that we respond to in this way, as opposed to what might fortuitously bring about an interesting or appealing array of words, sounds, or shapes, and also perhaps what it takes to be responsive to the art of others, can thus provide clues to what it is to be human, of what it is to be a self or a soul like us, that are very different from what one gets when one thinks about what it takes for someone to be able to engage in moral deliberation. Thinking along these lines, then, is apt to highlight a somewhat different set of faculties, abilities, and sensitivities from those we notice when we take the paradigm of human activity to be deliberative, rational action. Insofar as we cherish those qualities that make us capable of aesthetic responsibility as well as moral responsibility, and those faculties that drive us to create art as well as science, 
It's important that we not neglect these qualities and faculties in our educational practices, our social policies, or our philosophical theories about what it is to be human. That's it. Just a pretty picture. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, now we have time for questions. Um, okay. Lorik? They have to use the uh, mic. Sorry? They have to use the mic. Ah, sorry, yes. Right. Yes, good point. Yeah. So, that is, uh, you were the first one. Thank you, Susan. It was very interesting. This one uh, issue I, I would like to ask you more about. So, your suggestion is that uh, Watson's in Watson's distinction between attributability and accountability, a static responsibility lies on the side of uh, attributability. But isn't it the case that uh, there's an important amount of uh, accountability there, so this aesthetic praise, aesthetic blame, that we think of the artist's choices and we can hold the artist responsible for those choices? So kind of, when one thinks about our practice, the, uh, maybe this, uh, uh, even though I would agree that there's some kind of difference in degree here, right, between moral responsibility and aesthetic responsibility, but it's rather only a difference in degree, but not a difference in kind. Ah, uh, no, yeah. uh, good. So, when I wrote the paper, um, I was thinking of aesthetic responsibility the way I way you've heard, and all I had in mind, I think, was we regard, when we regard the aesthetic qualities of a work as expressing or manifesting something about the artist's self, we respond to the art, you know, we, we form attitudes, emotions, and judgments about the artist. And that's just attributability. So my thought was, the word responsibility, at least often, seems totally in place here. It has nothing to do, I think, with um, the, the practices of holding someone accountable. And so I thought, that's all attributability. And so when I wrote the paper, the, the, first, the initial draft, it was thinking, just forget about morality for a minute, and then you can focus more clearly on ways in which we regard ourselves as responsible and respond to each other as responsible agents that are that's all about attributability now actually which is I mean this was the, this particular paper has been in in the works for a while I'm inclined to say well there is perhaps such a thing as accountability in aesthetic contests as well as um, attributability and I would also say in moral context, there is such a thing as attributability as well as accountability. So I, I don't mean, even though it's quite easy to infer this from, from what I just told you, to think aesthetics is all about attributability, morality is all about accountability, and put, line them up with each other. Rather, what I would now say um, would be sometimes we respond in, there's these two different kinds of responsibility, let's say, and both the moral and the aesthetic and all kinds of other cases or domains can, you know, can be about either one. So it's not so much a matter of there's only one kind, it's a matter of degree, so much as there's more than one kind, but you see it all over the place. I don't know if that's exactly. Okay, we have uh, Paul, and let's just see, so, I'm, and we have Willie, but there was one Okay, so after Paul, you will get. Susan, thanks so much. I, I found that extremely interesting, and I mean, I feel like I've got a, a whole series of things I want to, you could follow up on. Um, but something you on about at the end strikes me as very interesting, important about uh, the interpretation of art and control, the artist's control. There are issues of control here, and that's how responsibility seems to come up. We've got this intricate area that we're working with. 
But I was thinking about this idea of whether or not the artist's intent is something we are, as it were, that constrains our appreciation of the art mm. and even our appreciation of the artist. I wanted to put this idea to you and ask you what you thought of it. Because <clears throat> I'm thinking of something like, you mentioned right at the end the, the analogy with language, and it seems like art, there's something about communication, and this is something that's very human, quite distinctive forms of being a human that we communicate with each other through art and various traditions that, that, are, that are available to us. But I'm thinking here is that there seem to be two kinds of things that go on, and actually I was thinking about children's art and knowing something about children's experience when we look at it. Right. And actually, a particularly evocative case of this is, say, looking at the paintings of children who were caught up in the Holocaust. Mm. So you look at that, and that, for most of us, affects us. Hopefully, it affects people, and we find some interest in it. But there's some sense in which, because of the nature of the child and the intent and the sophistication, you can see issues of responsibility here. There's not complicated artistic intent. But the proposal I've got here is it brings out, in my mind, it makes me think there's something that uh, this distinction is going on which means that art transcends intention and a certain kind of control. And then there's an interesting question about what artistic control <coughs> is in relation to intent. So the idea I've got here, and I, don't, I mean this is a proposal that comes out of just, I'm just responding as it were to your, to your uh, thoughts, is that what's happening in art is we're not confined or limited to what we might be interested, very interested in what the artist, especially a sophisticated artist, does intend, and that might be quite important to our own appreciation for a whole variety of reasons. But art also seems to convey something beyond intent, which is it conveys something about the experience, if you want, the sensibility and the subjectivity of the artist. Right. And the artist herself or himself might be quite unaware of that. Right. It might even, for certain kinds of reasons, be opaque to the artist. But one of the things about a really great artist is they're able to per convey something, and that, and if, if I can put it this way, it transcends the intent or the narrow control of the artist understood in those terms. So if that seems like a... F um, and that's an interesting question about responsibility then, because then you've got this question about where control comes in there. So one way you might go that on that, if, uh, maybe I'll just quickly finish up. If I put this, I'm interested to know what you think of that as a, as a suggestion that art really is not about simple communication and not constrained in the way language is. That that's one way in which art really is different from simple speech, that we're not just concerned to know what the speaker was intending. We're actually interested to know something that they may not be intending. Namely, it's a bit like hand gestures, as I'm waving here. We read people a little bit about their hand gestures. So we read a lot more than just what they're saying. We, we read a lot about their personality and their type by their general deportment. Right. But then control here, just as one last quick point on that, you might say that that means it goes beyond control because we're looking at things that, as it were, they may not be aware of, and in that sense they don't control. But I'm wondering if there's a broader notion of artistic control, whereas what happens with a really great artist, a really significant artist, is that part of their control is that ability to find modes of communication that transcend intention in that way, that they find actually the discipline. It's a kind of control to have the disciplines and the art of, and the capacities to communicate in those ways that transcend straightforward intent. So thank you for that. There, I probably don't have all of it in my head. So for the... The main point that um, I took you to be suggesting is that we think of art as an instance in which that it can transcend intention and its ability to communicate slash express an artist's self. That's exactly what I wanted to say. So I, I wanted uh, so if uh, maybe that um, went by too fast. That I thought the intention. If you take intentions as opposed to something else, psychology generally, right? Yeah, intentions aren't what the, and I think of control in the first instance is closely related to intentions. My point was that when we regard an artist as responsible in the, in the sense I've been talking about, it isn't about their intentions. It is about this thing that's transcending their intentions, but they're expressing their perspective in a way that they might not 
be aware of. They certainly might not be able to say. They certainly and can't control and make decisions. It, especially if you're not aware of it, you can't decide to do it, right? So I was total. That was my exactly what I wanted to say as a way of showing. Look, this is not just moral responsibility in the standard sense turned turned towards art. Um, uh, one other comment, though, that the range of examples made me makes me want to comment on is that look, there are different ways art, and I think for that matter, language actually. Um, I mean, some some artists in language, but uh, um, can tell us something about the artist. And some of them, I think, are not aesthetic at all. So mentioning the art of children, children from the Holocaust, children who've suffered trauma, are, um, are good examples, I think. But um, uh, sometimes they can just, they can be evidence for what happened. I mean, so that's, you know, psychiatrists will, you know, have a child draw and what they draw will tell us something about what actually happened to the child that the child herself wouldn't be wouldn't tell us or be able to tell us or maybe right um, that's not aesthetic that's something else um, so we want to separate everything you get about the artist's psychology from their work from what I was concentrating on which was the ability to have an aesthetic way, you know, vision, and right that you say, well, that that is a person. Only a person can have. Only a human can have an aesthetic vision, and that's why um, we can see that. But you can see that e sometimes in a in a human who can't actually describe things, or um, and, and so that's a way of kind of broadening the idea of what humanity involves. Uh, I have. Um, I, um, I I'm not suggesting that I can measure up to your intelligence or anything, but um, I have two questions. One question is: you, Surely you must be suggesting that intelligence can be traced in in a in a piece of art. Can be traced. Yeah, you can see that it's, it's an intelligent person that has made that piece of art. Well, you can be mistaken, but you yeah. can be mistaken. But, but typically, mostly, mostly. yes, right. And um, also, if a certain artist makes a piece of art that uh, another certain person thinks is better than other pieces of his art, yes. Uh, how do you explain that? Uh, if uh, I mean, uh, he, he's got the same uh, urge to create, and. Uh, He's got the same intelligence always. Ah. So, uh, have you any explanation to that? Uh, well, I don't have a particular explanation. I don't see it as threatening anything either. I mean, I, um, you know, sometimes we just do better. I mean, we it, it actually fits with the fact that we don't have control, you know, control over what we're producing or about how good it is. I mean, this is true in philosophy, too. The same person writes different art essays or books, and some of them are better than others. They're, you know, they're not trying, I'm going to write a second best book <laughs> is never the intention, um, but it happens, right? I, I'm not sure. Well, um, it makes it difficult to, to measure uh, art, it's particularly because it's uh, it differs in levels of uh, appeal to another person, right? And it differs in between other persons, and yeah. So, okay. oh, so all right. So there are, there are a couple different questions here. What, so one question is uh, the way I first heard it is a person, the same artist, um, may produce multiple works, and some of them will be better than others. To some persons, right? So that's where I heard this. I heard there are two different questions here. One is leave the fact that a, a variation in opinion aside and you say well how can an artist you know if an if it's all an expression of the artist and the artist is uh, equally good and equal and stable right how is it that one work will come out better than the other 
But then the other question, which I now hear as being the more important question, is look, different people will have different reactions to the, a range of art. Yes, that's right? what I mean. Yes. Um, well, I meant, I meant to include that when I said, look, I liked Henry James, but not James Joyce. I, it's not because one of them is better than the other. It's just that one of them I, I respond to with more... I mean, part of it has to do with me, the, the reader, and part of, you know, and what, what sets of uh, ideas or sounds or whatever seem to bring out something important to me rather, you know, whereas someone else will find other things more interesting. Um, so I don't, I, right, I don't, I don't, not I'm not sure. I think uh, you have explained it uh, quite good. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question that's uh, slightly related to Paul's maybe. So I was thinking of... Where is uh, this coming from? Here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, right. I'd like to... <laughs> um, <That'd be> funny. <laughs> yeah, so I was thinking of the example you had with the, the painting and the accidentally... Uh, the, the paint can that yes. uh, right. somehow can go back ended up on the, yeah. on the canvas. Um, and, and I was thinking about improvisation. And so, so in a way, part of the artistic process that sort of transcends intent, but maybe in a different sense than, yeah. than Paul meant. Um, so, so, I mean, so the improvisation can be part of the creative process, but it can also be part of, of the performance of the art as well. Um, so my question, I guess, is if you have anything to say about how that fits in with your idea of aesthetic responsibility, sort of would you say that it would, that kind of art is somehow perhaps not appropriate to have these kind of reactive attitudes toward, or do you think it, it would fit in with something that expresses your, your aesthetic vision or something? That. Well, I think it could express your aesthetic vision. I, I mean, it's a, it's a it's an interesting question. I guess I um, there are different kinds of improvisational performances, um, and I mean, when I think of some of them, I think, well, I don't find myself responding to that with a sense of who the person is behind it. But then there are others, I mean, you can certainly imagine like improv comedy right, being extremely um, expressive of, who, of a self behind it. The fact that it's improvisational doesn't seem in any way to, to call that into question. Does it to you? I mean, I, I mean, is there a particular problem with applying it to these cases or is it just... Well, I was thinking, so in the case of improv comedy, Could you pass the microphone again? Sorry, we are lacking oh. the microphone. Just oh. you. Yeah, I guess in the in the case of improv comedy, you it would be uh, a certain kind of group, a certain constellation of people, maybe that performs. Oh, I was thinking of an individual stand-up or ah, something. Ah, right? okay. Right. Right. But it, right. Yeah. It, that's a whole other question right. about group uh, group creations, but. Yeah. Since you didn't ask that, we'll <laughs> no. I, I, right. I guess my right. my general question was more about the sort of accident versus control and oh. accident versus expressing an aesthetic vision. Uh, how, how tightly uh, control or how important control is to this notion of aesthetic responsibility. Okay, I, so I was all right. General. Well, one thing I would want to. Uh, clarify, which I, as I was presenting it today, I thought was obscure, is I was understanding accidental not as the opposite of control, um, but as uh, the opposite of unconnected to the psychology of the artist. So the paint, can, you know, if you knock over the paint, it's accidental, like there's nothing going on. If in a somewhat, um, you know, drugged state, you paint a pic painting, uh, that's not accidental. It's just even though your intentions might not be, 
you, you might not be intending to get exactly what you get out there. It's not accidental. You're doing it. It's uh, and express and may well be expressing something in doing it. Um, so I wa so it's not accidental versus control. It's uh, control versus not necessarily controlled but expressive versus accidental, where the it's just the paint can fell off. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you can say a little more about uh, the connection between the relevant notion of attributability, responsibility, and the emotional reactions. So we can see, um, in some cases, we can see how certain evalu evaluatively or emotionally relevant properties of an artwork reflect something that's also emotionally relevant about the artist. Uh, but they, they can also be reflection that doesn't seem to be emotionally relevant and sometimes not evaluatively re relevant, but it's still aesthetically interesting. So there is style. So, so a, a, an actor has a certain style that you might like or not like, but uh, a certain performance reflects that style, even if it doesn't necessarily reflect an aesthetic vision, because maybe the director is putting constraint on the actor to behave in a certain way and using the actor's style to get a certain effect. And it's really reflective of that actor that it came out this way, but it's not the actor's vision. And you might like it or not like it. But So here we have a reflection of uh, the actor in the artwork, but it's not uh, necessarily evaluative, um, and it's unclear how emotional reactions would go with this. So, I mean, there are various kind, various complications here. So I, I ju yeah. I'm just looking f to hear more about the relation, relationship with the relevant kind of responsibility and the reactions to it. Is the kind of responsibility, is all these kinds of reflections instances of responsibility of the relevant kind or do they have to be of a certain kind that merits evaluative or emotional reactions? Yeah. Um, it's a good question, difficult question. Um, one thing I want to say about that kind of example is it's not aesthetic responsibility. So if you, I mean, if you're responding emotionally to an actor because of something about the actor's style, um, but the actor is being employed in the, in part due to his having that style by the director to do that. Um, you wouldn't say that the actor is res is aesthetically responsible for what's working in the context of the film or the play or whatever. Right. There's no aesthetic responsibility there. Um, at least there's no, none that the actor gets. However, um, something that hasn't come up yet is e even though the the uh, the talk uses the case of aesthetics to refer to the to just get us to look at responsibility that isn't about accountability. Um, it's not that I think it's restricted to aesthetics. So I think there's a there's attributability responsibility all over the place about all kinds of things that we do that are manifestations of ourselves. So, I mean, I do have emotional reactions to actors, you know, over their, you know, the range of things that they will play. I mean, again, some actors, uh, it's easier to have that reaction because they're more consistent in some ways. I mean, there are always certain aspects of them that's, that you see in all the things they do. Um, and others are more chameleon-like, and you can't, you don't have a sort of sense of who the actor is other than a very good actor. Right? Um, and there might be some kind of attributability going on there, and some, but it's not necessarily aesthetic, but something else. Uh, yeah. But that's uh, Ingo? I'll take up what 
uh, uh, use, uh, <coughs> interpreted into Ulle's question, that of group creations. In all your examples, I've thought of it for long. Shouldn't you take some group, <laughs> group creation? You have individual artists, individual composers, uh, individual writers, and so on. But to me, it seems to be a trend that in more and more cultural areas, there is, so to speak, group creations. And in particular, it's quite clear since long in popular music, and even best perhaps in uh, small jazz orchestras, since they right. are often, or can do now and then during an evening, simply improvise. That uh, can be extremely good. Yeah. And then I guess that many in the audience can and do fall in love with uh, such a jazz group as, for instance, uh, well, take Beatles. I don't know how many people, not, not only girls, but also boys, simply fell in love with the uh, Beatles. And uh, since you mentioned yourself the notion of group creation, please, I would like to, s to hear a bit more about your thoughts about this, since I, uh, you convinced me very much about the rest of what you were saying. And if groups are brought in, I think this tells us something about how we as philosophers look upon human nature in a way that you want us to broaden our view. Good, thank you. Uh, well, anecdotally, having grown up with the Beatles coming into popularity, in my world of 12-year-old girls, the question was always, who's your favorite Beatles? It was n you did not fall in love with the Beatles. You fell in love with Paul or George or John. Once in a while, Ringo. But <laughs> really, I was, a I was team George. But, uh, right. So it was actually not. And actually, if you listen, and if, if you're a Beatles, I I'm not actually a super big Beatles fan, but if you listen, uh, you can tell the difference between what John has written and what Paul has written, I think. It's, and so that's actually not the perfect example of group uh, authorship, I think. Um, but you're absolutely right. You can find um, that there are some groups, musical, uh, musical groups, uh, dance groups also, because a lot of dance is, uh, you know, there, sometimes there's a single choreographer, but a lot of dance is done in this other way. But, you know, some films, some film, there's some, right, there, so there absolutely are groups that can be responsible for a single work or a range of works and that you can have, I think, these strong reactive attitudes to them as groups. And that's a really interesting phenomenon, I think. So, I, um, so one interesting thing is, when can you and when can't you? Like, because there are lots of things that involve multiple people to create a work. And, you know, I think, the ones in which it seems to me reactive attitudes are most likely to be felt and most appropriately felt are when there's a real coherence in the, uh, in the vision of the group. Um, and that, again, as you say, suggests something really, something else important about what it is to be human, namely our capacity to, you know, create collective visions uh, and and do something with that and respond to that. So that I mean, that is a an important area for further exploration and development of the concept. Um, but there are also I think lots of cases where different people have a hand in a work of art, where there might not be so much coherence in what they're doing. Like they, you know, they, they, there could be all kinds of fighting, <laughs> and it might still produce a very good work of art. I mean, there's no guarantee. It's not necessarily a disaster, but in those cases, I'm just not sure that the concept of aesthetic responsibility is a particularly useful one. I mean, you just, uh, as I said, I don't. I'm 
not inclined to universalize about there's all you know whenever there's a work of art there's always an artist that bears the responsibility and it's always relevant or useful or worthwhile to consider that I don't think that's true and I think there are lots of times when one just doesn't think about that one just thinks about the work and how you know why it works the way it does without asking those questions so Yes, and um, lately the, the question of improvisation and, and performing has uh, entered the debate. And I want to bring it in even more because I think um, if we talk about perform performing arts, there is clearly not an originator and the audience or the spectators. There is a, um, um, lots of people that mediate it. We may, they interpret the work of music or the, the play. Um, and um, I think when it comes to, to these people, the, the question of responsibility is quite clear cut. We hold the, the musicians, for instance, responsible for what we hear. Um, of course, uh, the composition is there too, and it might sometimes be hard to distinguish between what we say uh, Beethoven wrote and what the pianist presents to us. But uh, um, it's much easier with with, uh, with um, bad music, but when the music is good, it's hard to tell the difference. You know, don't know where Beethoven ends and the musician starts. But um, um, they are accountable to a high degree, the, the, the musicians, uh, when they play a thing, and um, it poses a lot of problems. Uh, there is a problem of the, the faithfulness to the score, which. Um, um, pianists should follow the score, but there is a degree of freedom, and where, where does that start? Because um, you can argue that there should be some kind of freedom, but the pianist can do um, 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 things out of taste, or downright stupid things. And um, then, then he, it's a moral question, then the pianist has betrayed Beethoven in a way. And even worse, is that um, you don't understand the structure or the content of the music and just you just play it. And the, then you might say, who's responsible for, for that clump of dead notes? Right, <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Um, well, so I think when it comes to, it, it's not actually just performing arts. Uh, uh, photography is another case where, you know, one per there's a, a particular, not too long ago, uh, example of this woman, Vivian, I can't remember her last name, there was a big film about her, where her negatives were found by someone in an, at an auction and he developed them, I mean, he, you know, it was a discovery, oh, here is this amazing street artist that no one knew about, and he developed them and chose them and presumably cropped them. So there, e even in a non-performing art like photography, there's the eye of the photographer and the next level of the person who had to choose which among the which among the negatives to be presented and framed in the way they were and so on but i guess i in that case and in the case of someone performing someone else's work you know a cellist performing bach or whatever there can be different you know there's different responsibility for different things right there's the responsibility for the piece which can be played in multiple ways, or at least m multiple realizations. And there's the responsibility of the performer uh, for how well or badly or what he, what the performer does with the piece. Um, and we can, I mean, in different contexts, we might have reactions to these different things. So if you see, you know, if you love a particular composer, you will listen to many versions, maybe of the very same piece and of cross pieces, and you'll have, so you'll have a view about the composer and a, and a view about the performers, each of which are compatible with each other, um, as opposed to if you just go to a performance for the first time, you don't, you know, you've never heard the music before, you've never heard the performer before, you can't tell what, what it is you're responding to, and that's okay, because again, 
there's nothing really at stake here um, until you decide, shall I buy another CD by this person or should I go to another concert? Or um, You don't really need to know who exactly is responsible. You just respond to the music and love it or don't. Um, but when you said, you also used the word accountable here and saying, well, there are and suggested something which I think is controversial. I don't have a, I don't come down on one side or the other, which is about, I mean, the idea that they're accountable. For example, a performer ought to stick to the score within a certain specifically limited, um, you know, uh, deviation. <laughs> uh, if you think there is an ought there, of a, a, a norm that, uh, that the performers should recognize, then you can, this would be a case of what, you know, Vodic wanted to say, it might be aesthetic accountability for doing, you know, for living according, you know, playing according to the norms that are, that in performing this work at a concert, he's buying into. And if he fails to do that, you can criticize him, you can blame him for it. And if he, um, but, uh, but to go back to the question about the variation in personal taste, uh, you know, these norms are not very clearly spelled out. Some people might prefer the more imp improvisational freedom, and others per pe a per another person wants to hear kind of the pure Bach <laughs> coming, out, coming out with, you know, where the uh, performer is supposed to be transparent. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the norms are, but if there are norms, then you can also hold the performer accountable for acting according to them. Yeah, uh, I just want, also wanted to make a small comment about um, improvisation. Um, in response to the first question, there were, it, it sounded like there was a connection possibly being made between improvisation and, and uh, accident. Um, and right, and I wanted to... And I don't want, I want to deny that yeah. because if, if you think about Jackson Pollock, for instance, I assume there was a lot of improvisation there, but it would just be false to say what he did was accidental. Right. Um, and something, if you look at a, the set of work, something gets revealed through that. When I think of improvisation in music, I think especially of jazz. And um, so Miles Davis, for example, is full of improvisation, but if uh, certainly, a, a personality or, or some an artistic personality comes through right. that work very clearly. So, um, so that you can uh, and you can make attributions there as well. So, I think you know. I, I, I think that's a good case in some ways for illustrating some of the points you wanted to make. And finally, maybe you're right about the Beatles, but there are other rock groups. Where it's the collective entirely. So when I think of, you showed the cover of the Grateful Dead, but right. their music was certainly the music of the dead, not necessarily Jerry Garcia. Right. Okay. Please. Thank you. All right. I was wondering about um, how this concept of aesthetic responsibility can inform the concepts or ideas about responsibility in other contexts. And then I was thinking about the criminal justice system. And I was wondering if you could comment on that this idea of aesthetic responsibility seems to direct a focus towards the relationship with the observer or the one who experiences the art and the artist, and that there is a sense or idea of responsibility in both of those parties, that the artist is responsible somehow, but the observer or the one who experiences the art also has this kind of responsibility that enables the person to make a judgment or to emotionally experience the art. Could this also be interesting somehow in the criminal justice context, where the judge is usually invisible and it's only the defendant who is being judged? Ah. I was expecting your answer, your question to go in a slightly different direction, to, uh, in particular to towards uh, restorative justice models where uh, the offender uh, 
gets into uh, a relationship with the the victim, or it could be the fa family or the victim. I, if, I suppose if it's a if it's a death, but um, where mm -hmm. there really is a a kind of responsiveness in both directions, which um, apparently is a very uh, uh, a very successful alternative to at least the standard kind of criminal justice system in America. Um, and that, so that was the one that I thought of where it's, you know, responding to art, you're responding to the crime, but not as a, as an uh, impartial observer so much as, as the actual victim of the crime. Um, I'm not sure how, how to, make sense of it in the case of the judge, but maybe, do, I mean, do you have some more specific idea or just think, just open-ended? I think it was quite open-ended, yeah. but just the fact that the judge is always invisible somehow, but you still expect the criminal justice system as a group of judges or the individual judge to be responsible in the way that you expect the defendant to be. Right. I'll have to. I don't have any very clear idea. I, tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about blame, and I'll, I'll bring back this distinction between attributability and accountability, and have a, a few brief words to say about how that might affect systems of punishment or how we think about punishment. I'm not sure if they follow along this particular line, but maybe by tomorrow I'll have an idea. I'll have a better idea. Right. I'll come back tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I was thinking about the discussion that Paul had in one of his articles from 2008 about Mozart and luck. Uh, and I'm sure you, you have a great answer to this as well, but uh, kind of an aesthetic luck. So you have certain pieces or artists even that you want to attribute responsibility. But a great deal of the reason why you want to attribute and responsibility is due to a kind of historical luck, like they had both resultant luck, but they're also their artwork, and hence them, in some sense, are put in certain circumstances where they have an opportunity to be attributed um, aesthetic responsibility. Right. So how how come how is luck luck present in this historical or just resultant? Um, well, it it could be both, couldn't it? Uh, uh yeah. I mean, I. I'm happy to accept all of that. Uh, I mean, that would be. Tr it's. I think when you're thinking of attributability, it um, it's less troubling or paradoxical that there's, you know, there's luck all over the place in um, in what made it the case that uh, a particular individual should should have created this particular remarkable work. Uh, I mean, you're not, yeah, I guess I don't feel like there's issues of fairness here. There's just, right? Um, I, on the other hand, I mean, there's, if you thought, look, anyone could have, there is this uh, uh, phrase, you know, if so, you know, if such and such hadn't existed, we would have had to invent him, right? Um, which, if I understand what's usually meant by that, it's like this this idea was ready to come out or this work was ready to come out and so that it was just this person that actually held the pen or the, um, was a, of minimal interest. In which case, it, it that does seem to suggest, well, how attributable is it even? But I don't think with great art it's like that. I mean, I don't think it, it's ever true that you know, uh, Mozart's symphonies were there to be written. It just wrote Mozart happened to be in the right place and time. No, only Mozart. <laughs> I mean, I mean there are interesting things that you get. I, I mean, this is maybe connected to that the earlier point about look. You get actually it was from Paul's question where I think you discover things through someone's art that may have nothing to do with aesthetics or responsibility at the time. The case was. 
you know, a, you, a child has suffered a trauma, but you only know because he's drawing this picture of this thing. Um, or, uh, but there are also things we read literature now and say, you know, this shows us what, you know, how sexist the, you know, uh, you know, Jane Austen's England was, right? Jane Austen wasn't trying to write about sexism, or uh, uh, maybe she, uh, maybe she was. Let's step back from that. <laughs> the point is, there's all kinds of stuff we get out of reading Shakespeare or Jane Austen or whatever uh, that's information um, that might be of great interest to us that that the artist isn't individually responsible for, and really, I would say no one is responsible for. It's just you know, it's there. But I don't think of that as the interesting aesthetic k kinds of stuff. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, so, so I was thinking when I, so there's absolutely this notion of historical luck that could be the, the historical circumstances that the piece is in, the produced and all of that. Right. And, and I'm inclined to agree with you, perhaps the time wasn't ripe, it's, it's Mozart. Right. Uh, so we'll play with that and then but the kind of historical luck I was thinking about that the reason I appreciate Mozart ah. as a, as a artist yes. that's uh, historical in the sense that it's due to resultant luck how his piece has been received and so forth and that puts him as an artist in a certain circumstance where I am able to appreciate him and he wouldn't have gotten that that. Uh, affirmation, that, that uh, attribution of my appreciation for him, if it wasn't for resultant effects. And I'm just... Right. No, it's, it's true. <laughs> right. And you're... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. okay. Susan, this could be treated as kind of a follow-up to that, just very quickly, but it was bothering me anyway. It was one of the several questions I wanted to follow up with you. I just, because you put weight on the, I personally don't like the attributability, accountability distinction for the very reason that you concluded with, which is that I don't think we have as clear and clean a concept as people suppose, and it presupposes some clear, I find it not, I find it a problematic just for what it's worth. I don't think I'm unique in that. But let's go with the attributability idea and the way it deflates this kind of problem. And now we've got this er, distinction that you're talking about between what the artist intended and what's communicated as sensibility that goes beyond that. But I, the question I've got is what kind of constraints, to go back to that, does knowing something about what the artist's intentions were put on what we can legitimately or validly attribute to them? So just to use the example, I think you had Hopper's Nighthawks up. Mm -hmm. So you see, you see Hopper's Nighthawks and you think, oh, that is very evocative to me of the loneliness of the human condition. I think you said something that that's what maybe said. So let's say we bring in, if you remember that scene in Annie Hall where Woody Allen brings in Marshall McLuhan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we Everyone bring in that. Edward Hopper, thanks for showing up. Right. And we say to him, well, we're all really moved here by the human condition being lonely and so on and so forth. And he says, no, 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 it's got nothing to do with that. In fact, I don't, I don't, I don't endorse that at all. That's certainly, he might, so an artist might say weakly, that's not what I intended, you know, you, if you like that, go for it, but that's not what I intended. Or, but they may sometimes say something more strongly, like, no, that's quite contrary to what I'm trying to get at. I'm seeing a really lovely human occasion of three or four individuals in a restaurant bonding with each other that's totally something different. Does that, does the, so the question I've got is in terms of your conception of attributability, what constraints does the artist's authority have in terms of the artist's intent put on our own the vali validity of what we attribute to them and appreciate in them? But does that mean that you can turn around and say, I still attribute this to you? It's like implicit bias. You know, here's a lot of stuff going on that you're not even aware of. Well, that's right. Good. I mean, that's an option, right? Um, I would want to take this, I don't have any general formulas of what the constraints are or whether the whether constraint might be too uh, clear a word. I mean, we have options here. Uh, speaking for myself for that example, so I like, I mean, I think it helps to use specific examples because we'll go in different ways in different cases. If that were said of that painting, well, in, in this particular case, we could look at his, 
output over many, many paintings. And you'd say, oh, please, you don't know, you know, either you're just lying or you have no idea what you're doing because there's, it's all over the place. You, every, every painting is human isolation. <laughs> so I feel as if, you know, in that particular case, you've got other evidence to say this is in there. Whether, and, and, and it can't be an accident because, I mean, could be, of course, but it's very, it's very unlikely over a series of things. But let's, forget, let's pretend this is the, the only painting of Hopper's we've ever seen. We see it, we react to it, as I think it's pretty natural to react to as human isolation, about, you know, about that. And then you, you know, see Hopper writing. You know, I don't know what people are talking about. I, it would give me pause. That's I guess that's the 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 main thing is it would give you pause. You one possible reaction is he doesn't know himself. Another possible reaction is if that was what you were trying to do, you have failed. And this is now I see the painting differently. It's less effective. It's not. I thought it was a great painting, and now I actually think it's, I don't know what to make of it anymore. I mean, uh, so there's a range. I don't think there's a, you know, but I think that's just, we just have to deal with the details, look at the painting again, read the stuff again, figure it out.